Sick of the fatigue and fog, fed up with the unpredictable flares, hangry from the super restrictive diets. Hello, and welcome to the Crunchy Allergist Podcast, a podcast empowering those who, like me, appreciate both a naturally minded and scientifically grounded approach to health and healing. Hi, I'm your host, Dr. Kara Wada, quadruple board certified pediatric and adult allergy immunology and lifestyle medicine physician, Sjogren's patient and life coach. My recipe for success combines anti-inflammatory lifestyle, trusting therapeutic relationships, modern medicine and mindset to harness our body's ability to heal. Now, although I might be a physician, I'm not your physician, and this podcast is for educational purposes only. Welcome, everyone. Welcome back to our returning listeners, and welcome to any new or first-time listeners. This is the Crunchy Allergist Podcast, where we talk about all things allergies, autoimmunity, and anti-inflammatory living. I am so excited and honored today to welcome a colleague that I have been fangirling over on Instagram and over and with her products, Dr. Diane Hillel Campo. She is a board certified general ophthalmologist, aka eye surgeon. She works in private practice in New Jersey. She is the creator of the first ophthalmologist formulated eye makeup line, 2020 Beauty. The line focuses on products that are more healthful for the ocular surface because of more helpful ingredients, better product design, and a real focus on hygiene. Something that we have been really excited to connect and talk about is the role of being more conscientious about what we put in and on our body, and especially around our eyes. And I'm really excited to learn more about that. Something I didn't share with you, Dr. Diane, is even though I do look at the conjunctiva or the lining of the eyes fairly regularly as part of my clinical practice, eyes have actually been one of those things that just make me nervous and a little uncomfortable. So I never got to do a full ophthalmology rotation. So I'm really welcoming this continuing education as we talk today. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm so excited to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me. I'm happy to share some new information, hopefully for you and with you and your listeners so that we can all get have a little bit more knowledge about all things eyes. Education can be so empowering and really allow us to take ownership of our health and our decision making. I'm super excited. Can you share a little bit how, as a busy eye surgeon, how did you end up creating 2020? How did you end up where you are? Okay, so I've been in practice for 26 years, and I'm actually a general ophthalmologist, so I do everything. I see office patients, children, to doing cataract surgery, to grandparents. In recent years, I would say, especially the past five years, but definitely the past 10 years, there's been a dramatic uptick in complications that women have been having from their eye makeup and their beauty habits. One thing that's been dramatically increased is dry eye. Dry eye is something that basically affects disproportionately women more than men. Dramatically disproportionately. About 80% are women. 75 to 80% are women. And about 35 million Americans suffer from this. There's been about a threefold increase in the last five to 10 years. What has changed? A lot of it is related to women's eye makeup and beauty habits. Number one, ingredients in commercial eye makeup can be toxic to the ocular surface and can be pro-inflammatory. None of us want to have things that are carcinogenic. So my products don't have anything that are carcinogenic. They're all vegan, cruelty-free. I have no endocrine disruptors in my products. All of that stuff is a given when you talk about, it's a catchword phrase, but clean beauty. Okay, all of that is given. We don't want, none of us want any of that in any of our cosmetics. But in addition to that, I went a step further and I took out any ingredients that could be inflammatory to the ocular surface, damaging to the meibomian glands, which are the glands that make the oils that are secreted into the tear film. I took away harsh preservatives that can be toxic to the corneal epithelium and the goblet cells. I put in hydrating elements in my products. 
So the ingredients are safer for the ocular surface. That's number one. Number two, hygiene. Hygiene, when it comes to eye problems that we see every day in the office, many of them in women and men, but women especially because they're using products on their eyes and sometimes not being great about hygiene and bacteria are very bad for number one, the eyes. They cause all sorts of infections from conjunctivitis to corneal ulcers to blepharitis, but they also produce lipases that are very bad for women who have dry eye because the lipases have irritants in them and they also break up oil layer of the tear film. So you want to keep bacteria away from the eyelashes and away from the ocular surface. My line focuses on hygiene. Plus, I wanted to create better product design. So for example, eyeshadows that are powdered shadows with every, there's fallout from the powder with application and with every blink. So when we use a slit lamp and we eye doctors use microscopes basically is what a slit lamp is to examine patients' eyes. When a woman is wearing wearing powdered shadows with every blink, we see the fallout into the tear film around the contact lenses, in front of the contact lenses, in back of the contact lenses, and the powders um, leach their chemicals into the tear film onto the ocular surface and their pigments. The pigments actually can scar. When you pull down the inferior fornix, you can often see black scarring in the inferior fornix and also in the upper fornix when you flip the upper lid, scarring, which is very bad. So my shadows are cream shadows. Mm -hmm. Stay put, no fallout. Much better for the ocular surface. That's what differentiates my brand from other brands. And my why was I wanted to keep women out of my office for eye problems. When you start getting into a chronic dry eye cycle, it's very difficult, number one, to treat and causes women to have chronic problems. And many of them cannot tolerate traditional eye makeup mm -hmm. because of these problems. Thinking back, that was one of the first symptoms that I really remember. I wasn't able to tolerate my contacts, but I also was not able to wear mascara without it bothering my eyes or ending up looking like a raccoon or it wasn't worth the price of admission anymore. <laughs> and I tried all the brands too. I went to Sephora and this, this would have been several years ago before clean beauty was as prominent as it is now, but that's what's made me so excited about your mascara. And then the serum too, which you, I think you had shared with me was actually developed for dry eye. Am I? Yes. Remember that? So, my, so basically, okay. So we'll talk about some of the products. So yeah. one <laughs> of my big products and a huge seller is my eyelash growth serum. Actually, here it is. This is a product that I had been using, there it is, <laughs> for dry eye patients for many years in my office. Again, it's a combination of oils and one of the, it's mostly cold pressed hexane free castor oil. And I had been using that, having patients with clean fingers put a little bit into their lids and their lashes at night before bed, men and women, they would wake up with their eyes feeling great. Mm -hmm. cause the cat the ricinoleic acid would number one stabilize the outer tear film but number two it down it would bind to the ep31 receptors that are on the conjunctival epithelium actually the conjunctiva has the highest concentration of these receptors and it down regulates allergy and inflammation okay so patients who would have an a dry eye patients part of the cycle is an inflammation anyone showburns patients um and patients who have seasonal allergies using this would down regulate inflammation and allergy and also stabilize the outer outer tear film and really helped then we noted patients were growing lashes 
and healthy and lustrous lashes. They started using it on their brows, but they would grow some brows. Researched it, and I found out that actually the ricinoleic acid increases the vascular supply to the root of the lashes and the brows, and it causes that it, it takes them from resting to growth phase and causes them to grow. I added in a little bit of coconut oil and also a little bit of argan oil. Coconut oil is antibacterial. Again, you don't want bacteria around your eyes. So that's wonderful. It's a natural antibacterial. Then argan oil is rich in linoleic acid, which coats the lashes, hydrates them. And brittle lashes break. Hydrated lashes they don't break. And so you get nice long lashes. One of the reasons it was important to me to make this and have this as one of my first products was that in most of the lash growth serums out there, okay, most of them, mm -hmm. there are hidden prostaglandin analogs. They're not disclosed. Okay. So what are prostaglandin analogs? Okay. So we eye doctors have been using these to treat glaucoma for the past 25 years. Okay, prostaglandin analogs as eye drops. We knew that they grew lashes and we always warned our patients that, okay, you're gonna use this eye drop. It's incredibly effective. It's once a day, you'll get lash growth. Now we knew that was a side effect. Yeah. Now what Allergan did, Allergan took one of those, Bimatoprost, and marketed it just for eyelash growth, not for glaucoma. What they didn't, now th that is prescribed by a doctor because it was, it's regulated by the FDA because it was an eye drop. It was a, a drug, it was considered a drug. So your eye doctor would have to prescribe it. The other side effects that come along with it which most people don't know, but eye doctors do know, number one, fat atrophy. People actually would get sunken eyes with prolonged use of prostaglandin analogs. Number two, discoloration of the skin around the eyes. Number three, iris color changes to brown. Number four, cystoid, and I've seen all of these, cystoid macular edema which is swelling of the retinas that can drop your vision. Number five, iris cysts. Mm -hmm. Again, as an eye doctor and someone who treats glaucoma, I have seen every one of these side effects. It also causes many people get allergies and red eyes. When you're risking blindness with glaucoma, these side effects are acceptable. Okay, it's an acceptable risk to have your eye color change, your skin color darken, sunken eyes, red eyes, tearing eyes when you're going blind. <laughs> okay, when the medication prevents you from going blind. Yeah. Okay, but it's a risk. We always think of things again, eye surgeons, we think of things risk benefit. Yeah, okay? absolutely. So, this, the benefit is preventing blindness. The risks are all of those. But for beauty, those side effects are not considered acceptable, not considered acceptable. And they're not beautiful. Yes, you will have long lashes, but you will have sunken red eyes that are surrounded by discolored skin and possibly affecting your vision. Okay. But Mataprost is prescribed by a doctor, and that's Allergan's Latisse, okay? So when your doctor starts seeing these side effects, they stop the medication, okay? But these smart other companies saw this as a big market. They made laboratory-made cousins that are 10 times stronger. For example, there's one called isopropyl clo prostinate. Anything with a P-R-O-S-T, prost, is a prostaglandin analog and has that five ring chemical a carbon chain in it. And it's 10 times stronger with 10 times worse side effects. So the women think they're using vitamins on their eyes when they use the Rodan and Fields products, Lash Boost, when they go and they get Grande Lash. They think they're using vitamins on their eyes. 
They don't tell their eye doctor, but really they're prostaglandin analogs that cause these side effects. We eye doctors don't know why their dry eyes are getting worse. And dry eye does get worse with a prostaglandin analog. There's a study showing that it kills the meibomian glands, prostaglandin analogs, worsens dry eye. It's because women are using these things that they think are vitamins. They're not, they don't know these terrible side effects. So I wanted to create an alternative. That's why I marketed this and have this. Number one, it helps. It's great for dry eye patients. And I have many dry eye patients, men and women on this. But number two, it causes lash growth without these harmful side effects, lash and brow growth without the harmful side effects. And I wanted to use this also as a platform to educate other doctors, women, and beauty editors. Again, beauty editors really are the KOLs of the beauty industry. So when I'm using this platform to educate them, and they're shocked when they learn all of this, they're shocked because they have no, no knowledge of this. This is the first time they're hearing it. I will say on the whole, I think that it's not discussed even in, or at least the role of FDA regulations or lack thereof, that is not discussed typically in allergy immunology education either. Like I'm assistant uh, associate program director for our fellowship and tip, it was years into being an attending that I learned this despite having a robust curriculum about contact dermatitis and other things that we will transfer from our hands to our eyes and things to think about. These aspects and some of the regulatory aspects to the consumer product and personal care industry are not discussed. And I think are really important when we want to take good, holistic care of our patients too. Absolutely. And what something that people don't realize is the cosmetics industry in this country is not well regulated by the FDA at all. In this country, only about 13 ingredients are are banned. And for the, for, in, for example, the EU and Canada ban about 1300. So my products, in addition to all these other standards, are made to EU standards. Again, it's not discussed. We don't discuss it in medical school. The beauty industry also is not really aware, savvy about it. These young beauty, ed- they're young women beauty editors and they don't really know. And actually other doctors, they don't know. I try to educate dermatologists about it all. That They're shocked when they find out uh, the things that I tell them. They have no idea. There's one, one dermatologist made a TikTok video talking about how she had no idea that her that her Latisse was going to cause the sunk. She had no idea why she had sunken eyes and she's ticked off now to learn at her age that there's nothing that can be done. And it was from the Latisse that she had been using for 10 years. She had no idea it was from the Latisse. Yeah. And until you just mentioned it, I did not know of the implications with worsening dry eye. Oh, yeah. And Definitely. Now, you know, there is a, there's a real going, oh, when I tried that one product that would have been an analog several years ago, where did that fall into my, my illness story and my symptom flare ups? And you just, you start to wonder. Yes, just, it know, does cause dry eye. And it also, there is a study out that shows when you do a controlled study that shows that it's the prostaglandin analog does damage and kill the meibomian gland epithelial cells. And those do not, once they don't regenerate once they're dead. That's a part of the problem. Once the glands are dead, they're dead. So again, that's one of the reasons why I created this to give women a healthier alternative and to use it as a way to open the discussion and to educate, a platform to educate. I have to say, I picked it up in part because I was excited to try the new mascara. I was just trying to get free shipping. And then in getting ready for the Dr. America competition, I was like, oh, every little bit helps. I was pleasantly surprised to notice like my dry eye was feeling better. So when we were messaging, I'm like, oh, that would make sense then because I've been doing a good job with my adherence of using it most nights of the week. (laughs) Oh, that's great. Good. I'm glad that it's helping you and that it's helping your dry eye. Absolutely. 
Yeah. Um, and I should qualify. This is like totally non-sponsored. I was just really excited. I love sharing things that are working well, especially I know we've expanded the podcast quite a bit. There are quite a few folks with who also have show grins that follow. So it's always great to like share, share absolutely. education and hacks and good product, all those yeah. things, because there's no sense in reinventing the wheel and helping get you the word out. Absolutely. I appreciate it. And again, yeah, you reached out to me and I was so yeah. thrilled because that's, this is exactly what, why I made these products. You mentioned the mascara and I'm going to talk to you about the mascara a little bit. Again, part of the problem with most commercial, practically all commercial mascaras is they have allergens in them. For example, carnauba wax is a big one. And then another big one is beeswax. Even there are other brands that say they're for eyes. They have beeswax in them. Anybody who has a pollen allergy will get red irritated eyes if they use a mascara that has beeswax in it, okay? And there are many people who have pollen allergies. They keep me in business. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. They keep you in business and they're miserable using their mascaras. So yeah. my mascara doesn't have, have these allergens in it. I took them out. I stripped it of those possible allergens. So patients yeah. like you who have not been able to tolerate other mascaras can tolerate mine. My understanding too, a lot of formulations have tar byproducts and other things. Oh yeah. You need to just be really concerned about it. It wasn't that long ago that we saw the big headlines splashing across CNN and some of the bigger outlets about, like you had mentioned, the carcinogens in any of those. So cancer causing agents in these products that really are at the interface between our insides and our outsides, the lining around our eyes, the skin, everything is very thin. It's a quick hop, skip, and a jump from something to get from the outside to our immune cells on the inside and create that inflammation and problem. Yes. And again, yes, carbon black, anything that could be a potential carcinogen, I just don't want it in my products. I really don't. So one of those things is carbon black, coal tars, and it has many names. When you, it's hidden in an ingredient list as FD&C black number two, it's hidden as lampshade black, or it has many names that could be missed. And so I do not have that in my products, but many other cosmetic products have them in it. And again, if there's any potential for cancer, I don't want it in my products. I'm a stickler for that. Um, and we brushed on this a little bit earlier, but unfortunately, clean beauty is what we're talking about, but there's no agreed upon standard for clean beauty. And this was one of the reasons I was really excited for us to talk because this is the due diligence, unfortunately, we have to do as consumers to know where the people making our products are coming from, what their mission is, how committed they are to truly being clean or just using clean as a marketing term. And I don't want it as a marketing term. I have two daughters. I was a single mom. I brought up my two daughters who are young women today. For them and their friends, it's unacceptable to have products that you basically use every day that are potential carcinogens or potential hormone disruptors. Another reason not to use hormone disruptors as an aside is the meibomian glands are androgen, they respond to androgens. So you don't want anything that's a potential hormonal disruptor near your meibomian glands because it worsens a dry eye. So I really do think about dry eye patients at the forefront when I created these products. I really did. Because that's big right now. We see a lot of it. But again, for fertility in young women who are using these products every day, number one, for dry eye, it's bad. But number two, for fertility, problem to use anything that, so I don't have any parabens. I don't use anything that could be any type of hormone in any way. If there's any study that showed that it, it disrupted hormones or caused problems, I don't want it. No, um, no. Again. As soon as I got my diagnosis, and then it was within two weeks that my middle daughter was diagnosed with food allergy, we had never had 
anything that extreme in our family history. It was then that I had started making the switch over to clean things. Once you know better, it's like you really want to do better. Yeah, absolutely. For your health. And you want to be around and you want to be around healthy. Be able to live out your life, a healthy life. And again, product design. So I made sure one of the things that we see in our offices a lot, or I've seen a lot, is women getting corneal abrasions from the wand. A lot of the wands have long bristles. So I have my wand should not cause any corneal abrasion because it doesn't have those long bristles. Again, I tried to do the best with, with product design too, to prevent women from having ocular injuries. Part of hygiene too, you can use disposable wands. We're trying to get them on our site, but I do know that Amazon has them available. And again, with a mascara, you go in and out, dipping it every day. And that you can get bacteria growing and bacteria again are bad. So if you use a disposable spoolie and then throw it away, it reduces your risk. And in general, what is the recommendation for how often we should be replacing mascara typically? Okay. I would say replace it, dispose of it every month, but actually the recommendation would say one to three months. Okay. So if you're someone who is more sensitive, having issues, you may want to think about doing it more often than what we conventionally have been told by our beauty editor. 100% getting, disposing it every month. And you may want to think about getting disposable bullies so that you don't, to make sure that you're not re-dipping and getting bacteria that live, then it lives in the mascara and you reinfect yourself every time you use it. And then speaking about hygiene, actually one of my first products, let me grab it here, is a hypochlorous acid spray. Yes. Talk to us about that because that is something I never learned about. Okay. So during pandemic, one of the things that we saw an epidemic of styes in the country because the masks, the nasal bacteria would migrate around the eyes and the bacteria causes inflammation of the meibomian glands. When they get inflamed, it's a sebaceous gland. It causes a pimple, which is what a sty is. So- Why do they hurt? Styes? Yeah, oh my gosh. Patients come in, yeah, they're in severe pain. And again, I saw so many patients, women with blep- number one styes during pain. Number two, blepharitis. Blepharitis is when you get the infestation of the bacteria around your lashes and it causes inflammation. And once you get the inflammation, again, it makes a dry eye worse. Your eyes become irritated and it can cause other infections. So I wanted to popularize, I wanted to popularize hypochlorous acid. Hypochlorous acid is a natural material. It's made by our neutrophils, okay? It kills 99.9% of bacteria within a minute. The EPA also approved it in March of 2020 to kill coronavirus on surfaces. So it does kill some viruses and it also will kill fungi. It's safe for eyes. Okay, so it's a wonderful product. We, we use it, it, eye doctors use it when patients have blepharitis. It's also used for rosacea patients and acne patients because when you spray it, and again, my, my spray is a fine mist spray and you let it air dry. I say to, to spray it twice a day around your eyes and eyelashes on your skin and then put it on a cotton round and scrub your lashes with it. Again, it will kill the bacteria that cause acne. It will kill the bacteria that um, cause styes. It will kill the bacteria that cause blepharitis. Rosacea is related to demodex, which is a mite. And demodex eats the byproduct of the bacteria. So if you reduce the bacteria population, it reduces the demodex population and it quiets rosacea. Okay, so this product is wonderful for many reasons. It can be used on eye makeup brushes as to sanitize them. You can take it with you in your purse and spray your hands when you're in the airport or in the ladies room. It's great for teenagers to put in their locker, their 
gym okay. bag or their lockers because it'll help them not get teenage acne. It's a great product. My spray, also the product design, it was about, it was the challenge was building a better mousetrap. So my spray is a fine mist spray. It feels great. Okay. As opposed to other products, which are not a fine mist spray. Also, there is a product that eye doctors have used for many years. It's called Avanova. The problem with Avanova, it is hypochlorous acid. We would use it for patients who had blepharitis because the bacteria around the eyes were bad. The problem with it is that you have to open this package and insert the spray top. When you do that, the only two things that degrade hypochlorous acid are air and light. So immediately you introduce air and the bottle degrades at the end of a month. Some patients don't dispose of it. So they're using basically a product that's degraded into water, <laughs> okay? I built a better mousetrap. Mine is made with the spray type on it. So mine has a two year shelf life, okay? We do recommend disposing after three months, but it should remain, in, just in case air gets introduced, but it should remain stable for two years. So more akin to what we would want to think about with vitamin C serums, that stability factor is really important to think about with hypochlorous as well. Right, hypochlorous acid, stability is very important with it. And again, you don't want to, you don't want to take this top off and introduce air. You don't want to do that. It's in an opaque bottle because you don't want light. Okay. That's what's important with this product, but it's a great, it's a great product. It's very useful. A lot of surgeons who do, or dermatologists who do cosmetic procedures will cleanse with this. Oh. Yeah because it's so comforting and it kills the bacteria. That'll be helpful to share, especially it's not uncommon, especially during allergy season, to see patients with flare-ups of their uh, allergic conjunctivitis, getting sty, just another tool. Oh yeah, I just this is a great product. Thing that reduces the bacteria load around the eyes, helps with dry eye, irritated eyes. It prevents irritation because the bacteria make lipases. The lipases are irritants. So it makes inflammation worse. So this is a great product. Women who, I don't like eyelash extensions, but- yeah, women, That was one more question I was going to ask you was about those because they're, they're so popular and they look beautiful, but- Okay, so but. they're problematic for a lot of reasons. One of the reasons is women don't clean the bases of their lashes and they end up getting terrible blepharitis and demodex infestation. So if you're going to do them, you should use this product to clean the base of the lashes and keep bacteria away. Another problem is that the adhesives mm -hmm. have formaldehyde in them or and formaldehyde donors. That's a carcinogen and it also is a toxin that can kill actually the base of the lashes. And, and it's an allergy, contact allergen too. It's a contact allergen, but it's also, I have seen patients who have bare areas because oh. it's killed the root of the lashes. In addition to that, it the lashes become brittle because of the adhesives and they break. So women under those long lashes are lash stubbles. So women become addicted. They don't want to take them off, even when you tell them. I've had to tell patients. I've even shown them, listen, you have a horrible infection at the base of your lashes. You need to take those off. And they don't want to do it because when they take them off, they're left with little stubbles. So they, they become addicted and they have to go and fill them in every couple of weeks because they don't want the stubbles to show. They're really not good for you. They're really not good for you. I'm not a fan. I'm not a fan at all. So I'm just thinking of, there was that trend recently of five things I would never do as a, and it sounds like that would maybe be close to your number one. <laughs> <laughs> Close. <laughs> the other thing I would never do, and I'll just mention it to your yeah. listeners, is tight line. Okay. Uh, so another product, all of these came out because of everything that I've seen. Okay. So 
tight lining is very popular right now. Okay. Do you know what that is? Is it where you use like the eyeliner, like on the inside? Yes. On the waterline. Yeah. On the waterline. It's very bad for many reasons. Number one, it blocks the meibomian gland orifices. The meibomian glands release oils into the tear film that stabilize the tear film. If you don't have the oil secreted well, your tears evaporate and it makes a dry eye worse. So if you block the orifices, you don't get excretion properly into the tear film, it makes a dry eye worse. And I've had many patients where that one thing, just not tight lining, has improved their dry eye dramatically. Okay. It's one of the reasons why I created my liquid liner. Okay. My liquid liner, it's called double duty. And it says on it, you must use it on the skin. It's a liquid liner so people can draw their wings and their wings and their, their little, whatever drawings they want to make. It specifically states not to be used on the waterline, to be used on the skin. It has a little castor oil on it. That's why it's called double duty. So it helps the lashes grow during the day while the serum works at night. Cool. So again, tight lining, very bad. Yeah, worsens a dry eye and the chemicals go into the meibomian glands and kill them. So you don't want to do that. You want to stay away from anything mm. that can harm the eye structures. Oh my gosh. I've learned so much. I tried my best to live without regrets, but it would have been nice to maybe have some of this knowledge as a 16, 17 year old, but at least I get to pass it on early to my, my oldest is just turning seven. She likes a little lip gloss here and there. So we have some time. <laughs> yeah. She's got a little time and hopefully yeah. by the time she turns 16, I'm hoping my dream would be that all the big commercial companies yes. would hear this message and would change over and take it to heart and make all their products free of all these harmful ingredients so that every young girl would be using healthy products um, and wouldn't have to worry. We wouldn't have to worry about scanning through an ingredient list. And a couple of things that I'll quickly just share in that we know, unfortunately, there is inequity and in we see higher rates of endocrine disruptors in bloodstreams of at-risk populations in BIPOC communities. And this is an everyone problem and really need those big players in the industry to step up. Yeah, I would love for them to step up. I would love for them to step up and hear the message. If they could just hear the message. And part of having them step up is that the consumers have to hold them to that standard. And when they start seeing that they're buying these products, mm -hmm. that's when they will get on board. I'll never have the money to market that Revlon or L'Oreal. They just have so much marketing dollars that I just don't have. So the only way, though, that they're, they will hear the message will be when it hits them in their pocketbook and they watch their sales go down and they see sales of a company like mine go up. Yes. Well, that just, really is the only way they will listen. We just had an episode a couple of weeks ago with Reagan Nelson, who's very active with Beauty Counter and went to D.C. recently to help advocate for better, safer beauty laws in the hopes to continue to get the word out. And we really do, when we're able to, it is so powerful to be able to vote with our dollars. And for those of us that are in a position to be able to do that. Yes, absolutely. We have a lot, we have many products that will be launched very soon. Oh, so exciting. And yes, so many products to be launched. I'm wearing brow gels. We'll have an eye makeup remover. We have expansion of our eyeshadow colors. So lots of exciting things on the horizon and please try my products. I hope you love them. I even have another mascara coming out, a tubing mascara. Shh. That's just for you and your listeners to know. Oh my gosh. I'm so excited. That, that will come out very soon. Oh, cool. Um, so yeah. people can find you at 
try2020.com and at try2020 on Instagram and put all of this in the show notes as well. I think at one point I also signed up for a coupon code. So if I can find that, I'll drop that in the show notes <laughs> for folks too. You know yeah. what? Let's make one for your listeners. Okay. Oh, that I would be have great. my team make one for your listeners. Okay. Uh, go ahead and suggest one and I'll give it to my team. I think the one that I have set up is crunchy allergist. So maybe we can just double check. And if it's not that, we can do that. Okay. That crunchy allergist. Yeah. Okay, great. That And that'll give your listeners a special discount. Awesome. Thank you. That's great. I'm so excited. And your price points, I don't remember them off the top of my head, but I looked at them and was not, it was no different than going to get a quality mask, you know, what I would have right. previously thought of as a quality. So I wanted to get, have things that were affordable for yeah. most women. Okay. Cause I have two daughters and <laughs> their friends and everything. And I wanted it not to be, you know, most doctors lines are, mo they're out or high end lines are outrageously expensive. And I didn't want that. So mine are mid priced. Like the mascara is 28. The, shadows are 24 but again you can get we'll give you a discount code so it'll be less and quantity or quality over quantity any day of the week yes absolutely uh, but they're not outrageously expensive the way some lines are and that was done purposely everything was done purposefully with my vision even the packaging the colors are my original colors of my original scrubs and my white coat so that was my blue of my scrubs 25, more than that, 30 years ago. <laughs> and the white of my white coat, that's the color, the colors that I use for my packaging. I'm so excited we were able to connect and we will have to continue this conversation. And I'm really excited. I'm excited for the new product launches and just to see this movement grow and to see 2020 grow. So thank you thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me on. I really appreciate it. If you have found this information helpful and empowering, I would strongly encourage you to hop over to www.crunchyallergist.com and subscribe to our weekly newsletter where we dive into all things allergy, autoimmunity, and anti-inflammatory living. Thanks so much for tuning in. I look forward to talking again next week.